Aloha, welcome back. I'm really excited by our next guest who's gonna be joining us live from Hawaii. By now, you have all participated in some incredible activities, met some speakers, seen some performers, um, and we are just getting started. As a reminder, if you're just tuning in now, we offer many types of accessibility options. We have ASL, audio description, and captioning that are being provided during the summit. We've also partnered with IRA to offer their service for free to all summit attendees who are looking for a live audio describer. You can get the IRA app on your smartphone. Be sure to check out the instructions on how this works on the reception page. Just look up IRA. Now, I know that many of you are super excited about this next speaker, so let's get right to it. Bethany Hamilton, you may not know the name, but you certainly know the story. At the age of 13, Bethany lost her left arm to a 14-foot tiger shark. But with her strong will and tenacity and perseverance, maybe a little bit of craziness too, she got back on the water in just one month after that first attack. She went on to win many surfing competitions and inspires people all over the world as a pro surfer a role model, and an amazing motivational icon. She's gonna be joining us from Hawaii and has the most amazing tropical leaf wallpaper behind her. We're gonna be doing a short Q&A with her after her session, so make sure to submit your questions to her in the chat box on the right side of your screen. This particular session is sponsored proudly by Chris Craft and the Winnebago Industries Foundation. And with that, we're going to go over to Bethany Hamilton. Aloha, Bethany. Did you ever, ever for one moment think you wouldn't go back? Once things came clear in my mind, I knew I'd be back. Sometimes it's good to surprise people. Most people would see this as such a horrible thing, but I see all the beauty and good that God has brought out of it, and it's just incredible how He can turn things that we don't understand into good. Aloha, no barriers. 
So to me, life is a lot like the ocean. Ever since I was a young girl, I spent my childhood and now to this day, it's still my playground. But the ocean has taught me a lot in the sense that one day you're getting the ride of your life and the next day you're getting completely pounded and humbled and sent to the bottom of the ocean floor. And so often it's just you never know what you're going to get. And to me, that's life. You never know what you're going to get. But oftentimes, you can choose to paddle out and push yourself past those challenging waves and get the ride of your life. So for all of us, there's so much life and potential ahead to be had. But also, life can be overwhelming with unknowns and so much pressures from many directions, fears and doubts, social pressures that can rob from us can make choosing our future difficult. It can make choosing wise decisions against the things that bring us down, like alcohol, drugs, self-hate, physical differences, and, you know, relationship struggles can make all those things so challenging. And I know how this feels. When I was chasing the pro surfing circuit, yes, even with one arm, I was doing it. I saw and was surrounded by many people and departing and body images, body image struggles and making poor choices that clearly pulled them away from their dreams and their, their full potential. It made it really hard not to let it rub off on me and stay strong in who I was. It was during that time in life that I learned some major key keys to living an unstoppable life. And now I've compressed what I've learned into some amazing principles that you can use too to be successful and confident. And in today's world, we experience influences moment by moment, checking our social media feeds, hearing people make random unthoughtful comments towards us. There's so many different influences that can keep constantly sway us this way or that way. So, and maybe you're an athlete facing an injury or you have a physical difference and you just, your future feels like a little uncertain. Maybe you're struggling with your health. There's so many different things that we struggle with. But what if you could overcome these challenges and turn these insecurities and doubts into confidence? Your fears and worries into peace. What if you choose your future to be bright? So let me tell you about my journey. Oh man, growing up here in Hawaii is pretty special. I had two amazing parents who had migrated to Hawaii in their pursuit and love for the ocean and surfing and a more simple life. My dad was from the east coast of New Jersey um, and he grew up surfing in the snow in the middle of winter and eventually he went and fought in the Vietnam War and thankfully he made it through that and he eventually made his way out to Hawaii. He went to college on Oahu and then made his way to Kauai which is where I was born and raised. And that's where he met my mom who is a total surfer babe from San Diego, California and she too was just chasing an adventurous life. She uh, she was one of kind of the pioneers of women in surf uh, in San Diego and so yeah she found her love for the ocean out here and met my husband where they got married and had my two older brothers and I and we just really lived a pretty simple life. They worked really hard to keep us afloat but they also spent a lot of time with us adventuring and getting us to the beach and that's where my kind of passion and love for surfing sparked. You know, I wasn't climbing the, the monkey bars, I was paddling out in the surf. <laughs> I mean, I did climb my monkey bars here and there, but <laughs> yeah, it was really neat just to kind of grow up with a deep love for the ocean. And on top of that, having two older brothers, they sure pushed me to be my best and kind of oh, push past my so-called limits. Um, so as I got older and older, I really dove into my passion for surfing. Sometimes I would go to school with my hair wet and sand on my toes from a pre-surf um, surf. And I had like 
a knack for it. I was really talented and skillful at it, but I also had the drive and determination and I love the competitive aspect. I started competing at a young age and I was kind of the one to be in my age bracket and even in the older age bracket. I would always go against the older girls and sometimes even the boys and um, I was rocking it. I started to really take competitive surfing serious and with the support of my mom and dad we started to travel uh, inner island for the National Scholastic Surfing Association competitive series where I was competing against all the top surfers here in Hawaii and I was only 11, 12 at that age and I was competing against um, juniors and seniors in high school and making heats and eventually that led to making it to the nationals at the age of 13, 12 and 13 I went to nationals and at 13 I finished second in the national scholastic championship finals against seniors and juniors in high school. So it was clear to say that I was heading on the right path in the right direction with being um, one of the best, with the dream to be one of the best female surfers in the world. I went home that summer kind of on the moon, you know, just feeling that that movement of pushing towards um, being one of the best it, and I was determined but little did I know what was to come it was that fall on October 31st um, Halloween I was surfing with my best friend off the coast of Kauai and it's the most beautiful day you could imagine and that beauty quickly turned into fighting for my life I lost my arm to a shark and yeah, I think of that day and what I faced and the fact that I made it through it is a miracle. I lost over 60% of my blood and yeah, it was crazy. Um, I had to get to the beach almost a whole mile. Um, my friend's dad brought me to the beach. But it's not so much about the awful moment or the awful day, but the moments to come and the way I approached my future from then on. I woke up in the hospital realizing that my arm was gone and my future was upside down and I didn't know what was possible at that point and just kind of feeling deflated. But I also had this warm sense of peace that I was thankful to be alive and that God still had me in his hand and I moved forward with gratitude rather than anger and frustration. I mean yes there was a bit of frustration and just that feeling of like I don't know what's, what's next but I was thankful just to be breathing. And I also had community surrounding me. And one of my first influences during that time was a guy by the name of Mike Coots. He had lost his leg to a shark as well, but he learned how to surf with one leg. And he came into the hospital and talked with me and said, hey, like, I think you can surf with one arm. I was paddling around this morning with, with one arm and practicing popping up and I think it's possible. And all I needed was that little hint of hope to push forward and know that there was something possible for my life and for my future. And I decided right then and there in that hospital that I was going to get out there and try. I had the willingness to try. I had that kind of theme of like, I don't need easy, I just need possible. And that propelled me forward. I think if we approach life with not needing the easy because the fact is life's not easy and it's not always perfect and there's always challenge being flung our way but if we approach life with i just need possible we're going to be able to achieve so much more than we know and dream of and that's certainly true for me so less than a month later i was back out there surfing again pushing it i remember popping up on my first very my third wave i tried to pop up on I stood up and rode the wave all the way to the beach and it was one of the best rides of my life. And from there, it was just a life of ad 
uh, adaptation. Rather than focusing on what I didn't have, I focused on what I did have. We can all do the same. We can focus on what we do have and what we can do and how we can just adapt through life. You know, there's constantly challenges being thrown our way and maybe it's not an arm loss, but maybe it's a relationship struggle or a physical difference or health issues. There's so many different things that can kind of be our thing that we need to adopt through. And thankfully, I got out there and tried and today I'm a happy mermaid still doing my thing and I love it. Um, I went on to actually continue competing too. I started competing less than um, six months later and I made the final of my very first surf contest with one arm and then I continued to compete around the state of Hawaii and then that next summer I made the finals of the nationals with one arm and you know it's not about the one arm really it's about how I adapted and chose to look for the good in the situation and for me my faith in God was key too I trusted that God had a promise for my life and a future and to just keep moving forward even though I don't know what my future looks like. From nationals, the following summer I ended up winning <laughs> and that led me to compete as a professional later on in my teen years. I started competing and traveling all over the world and you know what? It was a blast and it was so hard but there was more to it. It was grindy. The pro circuit is not easy. Everyone's partying, making tough decisions. I was surrounded by people with eating disorders. And these were hard to bear, hard to be around. But I made choices that brought my fo future forward. I chose to uplift myself and make choices that supported my, my talent and my body in the way that it needed. So these compelled me to learn many things that I now want to share with you. The biggest thing, seeking community that was uplifting. You know, I had some friends that were struggling and I still love them, but I sought after people that were going to uplift me. Be coachable. I continued to be coachable and continue learning and growing. Learning and growing doesn't stop. If you continue to push yourself and be coachable and learn and grow, these will support to an unstoppable life. I knew my why and I chose my future. I didn't let people around me choose my future. Yes, I listened to their advice or yes, I learned from their mistakes, but I chose my future. I then went on to continue focusing on my nutrition and living a healthy life. When we're healthy, we can go and chase the dreams and things that we love to do. I stayed mentally strong. I love this quote from Gabby Reese. She's a part of my Unstoppable online course. She says, if I flip me, I flip my environment. Sometimes our environment's not always warm and welcoming, but if we flip how we approach our environment, then we, we flip our environment. So finally, I stayed strong in my faith. And I know not for everyone, faith is not a big part of your, if it's not a part of your life, then focus on values that you hold to. Take some time to think about the things that are important to you in your life and how you want to live out your life. All these things help me to live and continue to live an unstoppable life. When adversity comes our way or tough, unhealthy influences are pressing down on you, you have the ability to overcome and come out stronger and more confident. You know, some I think of some of these influences that I faced. One of my all-time favorite surfers as a young girl, I remember I was about 10, 11, and I had some of these surfers that I would paddle out and be so stoked to watch them surf because they absolutely ripped. And they, in my eyes, they were some of the best surfers in the world. But they had a dark side to them. And they allowed that dark side to overrule their talent and beauty and skill and future. One of my all-time favorite female surfers who was pushing surfing more than anyone I knew. She dabbled with drugs and that dabbling dove deep into abuse 
and that abuse overtook her life. And she's still alive to this day, but she doesn't live a life that I admire or that I want for myself. So I urge you guys to think about the things that bring us down. Become aware of those and say no to them. I said no to drugs and I don't regret that. I look forward to my life every day. I wake up today and now as still a professional surfer, a wife, and a mom. And I, I'm excited to wake up and live my life. And I don't have drugs stealing from my beauty and my purpose and my passion and skill. Another thing, I, I want, another story I wanted to share is one of my best girlfriends who, um, you know, I love so dearly, but she got carried away in eating disorder. It got so bad to the point that she was losing her hair and she was so frail and kind of losing life and that urged me to take care of myself and focus on my nutrition because I wanted to be unstoppable. I wanted to be powerful in the surf. I wanted to be the best that I could be in the water. So I urge you guys to think about the ways that you can care for your nutrition and health. What else? Another thing I wanted to share is um, I continue to kind of not think about the limitations that having one arm held, but how can I be the best in the ocean every day? So I would focus on my fitness and push myself in the gym so that that would carry over into the ocean. I didn't let the barriers of one arm hold me back from the skill that I had in the ocean. And I would strengthen my body from head to toe, not only physically, but mentally. I would wake up thinking about how strong I was as a human and how I could let that mental strength carry over into my physical and let that carry over into the ocean. You know, there's so many different negative influences that come our way, and one of the greatest ones we face now is social media. If you're scrolling and getting carried away in the negative that you see or comparing yourself to other people, while meanwhile you could be out there living out your own life, stop having FOMO on everyone else's life, but live your life and be propelled forward. So set your boundaries, you know, there's boundaries that we could all set to propel us forward and keep us moving and working out our dreams and goals. I look at, um, you know, sometimes I just completely just turn my phone off and go get in the ocean. Find a place that you can be present and stick with your own true thoughts rather than constantly being filled with what other people are doing and what the world's saying and what the news is is going after and i'm not saying don't be aware of those things but find a place where you can be just you a place where you can dwell on your dreams and your futures and your possibilities and know that you can achieve even more than you dream or know of so when all these that when we all we all face times in our life of negative pressures unsurety adversity that can shake us to our core we can hold tight to our our identity our whys in life when we surround ourselves with an amazing community and take care of ourselves physically and mentally when we choose patterns of choices that build our future we can stand up to the pressures that are thrown at us and we can be strong and confident in ourselves when obstacles come our way and we can live an unstoppable life. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Bethany, for that powerful message. I just want to make a point of Bethany said it's so important to have community in times of strife and we hope that this no barriers community can be a part of what you join and stay stay connected to after this summit certainly Bethany I hope one day you'll give me surf lessons if I come visit in Hawaii um, 
we did mention that we were going to take some questions uh, from our community in the chat section there and send them over to Bethany. And so we've sent them over and we've asked her to answer a few of those. And so Bethany, we're going to send it back to you and hopefully uh, you can answer some questions from our participants. Okay, so we had some questions submitted. So we're going to finish with these questions. So you're a mom now of two. What's your favorite thing about it and how do you like being a mom? Well, oh gosh, I love being a mom. It definitely gets me up every morning excited to be the best I can be as a human, um, be a good wife and mom to my boys. And it's definitely the most challenging thing I've ever done as well though. Um, you know, kids always have you on your toes. They're always challenging you. But I think they're challenging you in a way that makes you a better human and you just have to live out your life with more thoughtfulness and be like sacrificial and like giving to them on so many levels. But definitely brings me so much joy and yeah, two boys and seeing them kind of now taking on a love for the ocean and surfing and just adventuring life and seeing it through their eyes is really special. Uh, it's so true, Bethany. I'm a dad of two and being able to share the joy of the things that we love with our children is such a privilege. Um, and so I'm going to change my last comment and just say I'm going to come to Hawaii with my kids and hopefully we can all learn to surf with you. Um, I would love to uh, ask our, I think we've had some other questions coming in. And so Bethany, I think, has, has agreed to take on one more, few more questions here. So I'm going to send it back over to Bethany. Let's head back to Hawaii. Okay, so many of us have seen your movie, Soul Surfer, and feel like we know you a bit because we've seen the movie or read your book, Soul Surfer. Do you feel like the film was portrayed accurately? And can you tell us about your new film? Oh, yes. Uh, it's such a joy to be able to share my life story or part of my life story through Soul Surfer. And that was a wild adventure for sure. Um, you know, when I think back on that time, like I kind of thought like, oh, it's not actually going to happen. And then things actually came into place. And before you knew it, I was picking out who would play me. I chose Ana Sophia Robb, who I thought she did an amazing job. And my whole family was very involved in the process of making the film and I think thanks to my family the film turned out good and yes we had a great team but I think having our involvement kept the story accurate and more true to who we are and um, what I had faced and how we went through it and so yeah I love just being able to have that film out there and then more recently I actually had a documentary made about my life so it captures me, the real Bethany, uh, from childhood to motherhood and just the journey of life and the ups and downs and surfing, specifically me chasing my surfing dreams um, and different goals that I wanted to check off the list. And then along the way I got pregnant, so me entering into motherhood and what that was like and still continuing a professional surfing career. And, um, I definitely have had my share of challenges and it's really um, to me a gift to be able to share our stories um, whether it's on a small day-to-day -day scale or on a bigger scale of sharing through film um, I think we can all share our life in, in ways that encourages and empowers those around us so I hope you all will share yours too next question many of us have had recent setbacks and we heard you recently had a broken elbow. Can you tell us about your experience and how it impacted your goals and how you worked through it? Yes, um, the year of 2020 has been crazy and really challenging. And about halfway through 2019, I decided to start putting my ambition back towards competitive surfing. Um, so I have two children and I just had finished filming my documentary and I was like, okay, like, what are we going to do now? But I just felt like there was still this like deep longing in me to compete and be competitive in my sport. So with the support of my husband, um, just put my head down for that goal. And then 
I broke my elbow midway uh, through the training season and leading into the competitive season in early 2020. So I missed the first event and I had three and a half months out of the water and it was just definitely a mind challenge for sure. But one thing I learned is, you know, we have different setbacks, but we still always have to look for what we can do. And I was still able to train really hard for my um, my goal and my dream and, and surfing. And so I put a lot of time into the gym and mentally I'm um, just watching heats and just kind of preparing for the year in different ways. And I remember, I think it was my second session back in the water after breaking my elbow and I felt like I hadn't missed a day. So I did something right when it came to my prepping, um, even without being able to be in the water. And yeah, thankfully my elbow's healing, my one and only precious elbow. So um, that's, I'm grateful for that. And, and then the COVID thing happened and I think the competitive year is canceled. So um, that goal is gonna be on hold for now. Uh, finally, um, what are you up to now? So what am I up to now? Um, well, I think the daily is a lot of just being mom and getting in the ocean surfing and still working on that. And I really enjoy speaking, so thank you all for having me. And um, I also have an online course called The Unstoppable Year where I'm empowering people to live their unstoppable lives. And it's such a joy to wake up to that and it has me motivated every day to share life with others in a way that um, is deeper and I'm truly seeing lives change. So I'm having a blast with that. And otherwise just continuing to look forward to the future and pushing myself to be the best I can be. So thank you all at No Barriers. It's been a pleasure to be here with you all and know that you too can break your barriers as well. Aloha. Aloha, Bethany. Um, that was a wonderful message. I know I speak for our entire community. We're really happy to know that your elbow has healed and you're back there in, out on the water. Um, also, my kids and I have been hosting neighborhood outdoor films in the backyard, and we are going to look forward to putting your documentary on our list. Thanks so much for joining us. You are certainly uh, an inspiration and definitely someone who actively lives and breathes that no bearers life that we talk about. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We spoke with John Bramlett this morning from his home in Texas. Uh, for those of you who didn't see that, John has started a painting that he's going to be painting over the course of the next two days. And John happens to be blind. He's the most famous blind p painter alive. No Barriers is going to be auctioning off this painting at the end of the summit. You'll be able to bid on it and take it home for yourself. Um, I'm really excited to see the progress that he has made. And so we're going to go back live to John in his home and see where, he's, where, he, where he is. How are you doing, John? Oh, I, I, I'm doing so well. <laughs> I'm having the best time. I'm never more happy than when I'm painting, so I'm having a great day. <laughs> but I started this painting the same way that I always start my paintings, by drawing it out. Um, I did illustration before I lost my eyesight, and those habits have just sort of stuck over. Um, of course, with a few changes. Um, you know, if you're a sighted artist, you're going to use your eyes to know where you are on a canvas and where you've been. But if you're a person with a visual in impairment, you're going to use your sense of touch. You know, it's the same as if you're traveling around a room or a city. So the lines that you see on the, on the canvas here, they're actually done with a special paint that I mix. I've got all these different mediums in the, in the studio that I, I can mix up and have fun with. Um, but this this black paint is actually sort of a sticky, almost rubbery feeling. So. I don't know if you can hear it on the mic. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet just for a second. So I don't know if that comes through, but, but it almost sticks to your hand. And it feels very different than the rough canvas that I have over here. So I'm working out the, this, um, this, this painting, and I've been so inspired by what's, what's been going on. It's been so great. So for anyone with a visual impairment, um, let, let me just describe what I have here. Um, we have a mountain view. There's vistas. And there's mountains that are receding into the background um, before the mountains are in front of it, taking up about over to the, the left-hand side of the painting, about the, the left-hand third, 
to the halfway point is a gentleman in a in a wheelchair and he's holding his his arm his arm stretched out and he's just celebrating he's so happy um but next comes the really fun part my the, the part that i love about painting and that's the color so um i'm gonna start blocking in the painting i'm gonna start adding in the colors and start getting the emotion and the feeling and the ideas and all the stuff that color re represents. So the next time that we check in, I'll have so much more to show you guys, but I'm having a wonderful time over, over here in the studio today. Thank you, John. That's amazing progress that you made. Uh, I can't wait to see how the painting continues to evolve over the next uh, 24 hours. So we will be auctioning off the final painting tomorrow, as well as two paintings from another participant, another teacher in our program, Grace Fisher, who is making some, some paintings as well. And as we're talking about the auction, we're talking about how to give to No Barriers, I want to make a, a request to each of you. I wanna thank you all for participating and I'd ask that you make a donation to No Barriers. Uh, this event and all the work we do at No Barriers is almost entirely funded by the generous gifts of people like you. To make a donation, you can head to the No Barriers donation booth in the expo area. Or you can also text to make a donation. What you do is you text the number that is behind me here. You text the amount you want to do donate to this number, so 646. 956-2648, you just type that in, and then you put in a number, and then you send it off, and it makes a donation to No Barriers. I'd also like to call your attention to our No Barriers swag, our merchandise, which we have in our online store. You can see I'm wearing some No Barriers swag. Check it out in the No Barriers store booth in the expo area. Well, now I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine, our next performer, violinist, educator, Chair of Music at the Milton Academy. He's a No Barriers board member as well. His name is Adrian Anatoan. Adrian's gonna play a few songs for us, but he also wants to share a bit about how music evokes emotion. Happiness, sadness, when we're, it can make us be uplifted, it can bring us some somberness. Music is able to shift how we feel. Um, just a bit of background before we bring Adrian on. Adrian was born without a right hand, and yet he has studied under some of the most famous musicians on the planet. He's performed at locations such as the White House, the Olympic opening ceremonies, and the United Nations. He has played for the late Christopher Reeve, Pope John Paul II, and the Dalai Lama. Adrian is also the founder of the Music Inclusion Program, which is aimed at having children with disabilities learn instrumental music with their typical peers. So with that, I bring you my friend and fellow board member, Adrian Anantawan. Hi there, my name is Adrian Anantawan. I am a violinist living in Canada right now. And I wanted to thank you for having me here at the No Barrier Summit, albeit virtually. But I think this is also a time that we're finding different ways to be able to transcend our boundaries in so many different ways. Music has that power to be able to convey a sense of human experience that feels universal. As much as the idea of struggle, disability, adversity has a way of really connecting all of us together in a common struggle and at the same time honoring the diversity that we have as human beings from our own lenses and our own viewpoints. I think that the violin, for instance, is a tool that was invented many, many hundreds of years ago, uh, not only to extend the range of the human voice, but also to extend the range of the human spirit. It has the capacity through very simple materials, wood and then four strings, to be able to express intense anger. Which was composed by Beethoven after he found out that he was losing his hearing. To tremendous sadness.
which was written by Mozart at the very end of his life, who died early and was really questioning the nature of his own existence, uh, to celebration. <laughs> piece of bluegrass music that I learned in the east coast of Canada, but uh, it just goes to show just the tremendous range that music has in order to convey a story. So I wanted to share a little bit of my own personal story, play a little bit of music that really helps uh, amplify the common adversity and struggle that face all of us. So I was born without a right hand, and... I think that my parents were immediately worried about how I would deal with the world socially, from being able to have friends, to colleagues, and eventually just people that I could just uh, connect to for the rest of my life. But I also think that they were very scared of presenting me to my grandparents who were living in Hong Kong at the time. Uh, and that was because in some folklore superstitious cultures, Disability can be seen as a curse. This idea of repayment for past sins of the family. So my parents brought me to Hong Kong. And my grandmother saw me for the first time. And she said, you know, there's nothing wrong with him. He laughs like any baby. He cries like any baby. So he's really just like everyone else. So... My grandmother ended up going to the marketplace and found a small trinket for me. This is a small bracelet and it has bells attached to it. And what she would do is put it on my small hand and that as I was wriggling about in the crib, be shaking this hand and nothing would happen. But if I was shaking my small hand, like this, I'd be very engaged and interested in doing it for hours such that I'd be developing my right bicep. Uh, so I don't know if this was necessarily a uh, real solution to be able to even out strength, but I think it was just the attempt of being able to see adversity and struggle as a way to overcome and to think of solutions that really don't... Uh, it's not really about who you are, but how you really just solve things uh, in order to overcome your challenges. So I also think that this is my first musical instrument and it set me up on a path to this violin, which I play for you uh, today. The uh, instrument, the first instrument in elementary school that was placed in my hands, however, <laughs> was uh, the recorder. And I remember being a little bit crestfallen about it because I look at the instrument and there are so many holes uh, through the tubing uh, of which I couldn't play all of them because I was obviously missing uh, five fingers. So my parents started looking for different options. Uh, the first was the trumpet, which um, was able to be held with one hand. I tried a little bit, but it was too loud for the house. My father thought that singing would be the least expensive, so I tried singing. I didn't have a great voice. So we settled upon the violin, not because it was the most practical uh, instrument, but the most beautiful as well. And we tried to just figure things out afterwards. Uh, it was hard to find a teacher at first, uh, and I think that my teachers, or potential teachers, didn't want to disappoint me and have me fail in some way. Uh, but there was one teacher who was willing to take a risk, and she said, well, one step at a time. So got the instrument and just started plucking it like this with my pinky finger. And that was pretty much the start. And then I had this device made at a rehabilitation hospital in Toronto, Canada called Holland Bloorview. It's a Velcro cast. Um, Sorry, a plaster cast with Velcro attachments here to keep it uh, 
snug. I have a little piece of plaster here, piece of aluminum that goes through the bow, and it really was uh, after just this going back and forth, and of course it sounded pretty bad, I'm sure. But the idea was that I was enabled in the sense not that I had all my problems eliminated on the violin, but I was sharing the same struggles as everyone else and my peers. And the idea was that we were trying to find different ways to be able to continually refine uh, our expressive tools, the violin in my case, and just using our technique, which is my body, to be able to produce a more and more beautiful sound. So going from scratchy sound, maybe more bow, maybe adding a little bit of color with the fingerings, And that really set me upon a path of continuing to study the instrument, to be able to go to college and, and then continue performing around the world. And, and I've been able to travel to see different places. And I think that one of the common experiences, as I said before, is that as much as music is a constant in the world, there are so many with visible disabilities and visible disabilities who are just trying to find different ways to be able to use their gifts and talents and skills to be able to contribute to the world. I think that it's so important for all of us to recognize that within ourselves we have our own disabilities. How do we overcome those and then how do we transform and how do we share those struggles with other people in order so that we can grow together as, as communities uh, and as people as well. And I think that in the end, all of us love to share uh, the best parts of ourselves, which is the uh, sort of Instagram pictures of the ideal life. And I think that in the end, the ideal life is really a life of struggle and triumph and that cycle that continues to drive us to get better, not only for ourselves, but for others around us. And the more that we can do that in whatever field that we have, we're going to continue to create a sense of personal excellence as much as just societal um, excellence in all that we do. So I wanted to play a few more pieces to wrap up, and um, a couple of them are very contrasting pieces. The first is the theme from Schindler's List, which is uh, a very sad piece, and I think really reflects uh, this idea of suffering and this idea of generations past connected to us that have suffered as well, and, and how we make beauty and meaning of that through art. Because in the end, hope isn't necessarily this complete idea of like being optimistic without understanding or regarding the struggles that are actually there, but to acknowledge them and to continue to make meaning out of them. The second piece is called Salut de Mor. It's a piece by Edward Algar, and Salut can mean hello or goodbye, and Amor is love. And I think that really speaks to this idea whenever we're greeting someone or seeing someone for the first time, or if they're leaving us, this transition of life, there is still beauty to be found in this world. So I hope you enjoy these two pieces and looking forward to connecting to you in person very soon. All the best. Bye.
Wow, that was amazing. It is now time for your activities. We'll see you back here on the main stage at 245 Central Time. Be sure to check out No Barriers University. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. See you soon. And I'm doing comedy on Zoom. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about um, my adventure in comedy and then uh, take you through some steps to writing a joke. Here we go. Um, you know, um, I started doing stand-up comedy in college. I um, did open mics for, it was like for music and poetry and then I went up there and was like, what's up? I got cerebral palsy. And uh, it really um, it, it, it really was such an exhilarating feeling like uh, to get on stage. To start with, I have terrible stage fright. Um, I don't so much anymore, but uh, when I was coming up, uh, I was terrified to give a speech or any kind of like 